Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on costly signaling. So last time we looked at the critical barrier to Civil War settlement, and we saw that what we really need is a third-party intervener to come in and pull the sides apart and make sure that it will uphold the terms of the settlement. But one important quality of that third-party intervener is to be able to credibly demonstrate to both sides that it is willing to uphold the terms of the settlement and won't run at the site of first blood. One way of credibly revealing your intentions here is to do what's called costly signaling. Costly signaling is prevalent in economics and political science and probably some other fields as well. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a good solid understanding of what costly signaling is because again, it's important to all sorts of things out there in the world. All right, here's the game. Imagine that you're a third party state. And you're thinking about going in and intervening in my country to pull us apart and make sure that there's peace. Now, because you have some sort of interest in my country, and that's actually something that's necessary for you to be someone who's willing to intervene, you're going to want peace in my country. You're going to want to convince me to not restart the war because that's going to be bad for you. Now, what I don't know is exactly how costly it is for you to have war in my country, or essentially, what is your value for peace? You might be someone who really wants peace in my country, in which case we're going to suppose that you value peace at $10 billion, and you might also be someone who does value peace at least a little bit, but not as much, and in that case, it's only $5 billion. So you value peace either at $10 billion or $5 billion, and we're going to suppose that there's a 50% chance of each of those, right? So there's some differential value in how much you value peace in my country. That's something that you know, but that's something that I don't know. Intervention is going to be more or less free if no one breaks the peace or if you leave immediately at the, at the site of first blood. Again, that's just something that we're doing to simplify the situation, to simplify our analysis. Suppose it's free to go there and, and just pull the sides apart, but it is actually costly for you to get involved in a shooting war. All right. And if you do get involved in this shooting war, if I challenge the terms of the settlement and you decide to shoot back at me and you get yourself involved in that war, we're going to say that that war, that intervention, is going to cost you $7 billion. Now, what that means is that if push came to shove, that type that values peace at $10 billion would be willing to pay that cost because $10 billion minus $7 billion is th still a $3 billion profit there. Whereas the unresolved type, that type that only values peace at $5 billion, would rather run away than stay and pay those costs of fighting. So there's some difference in whether you're resolved and unresolved and whether you would actually stay in the country if push came to shove. Now suppose I am the government of the country, and I'm thinking about taking advantage of that shift in power. So we made peace, the rebels disarmed, now I'm relatively stronger than the rebels were just a few months ago because the rebels have given up their arms, and so I'm thinking about reneging on the settlement and trying to get more for myself. Now, because you have this differential in how much you value peace whether you're committed or not committed, if you are committed to the settlement, I would not want to try to overturn that peaceful settlement because you'll intervene and that will be bad for me. So if you value peace at $10 billion, you're willing to intervene and that credible threat to intervene would cause me to not want to challenge the peace. But on the other hand, if you're this uncommitted type, you would run at the site of first blood. And so I would, as a result, want to challenge the status quo. I would want to try to renege on the settlement and get a better settlement for myself because I'm going to anticipate that you're going to run away. Now, in this situation, we made it so that there's incomplete information. So I don't know exactly how committed you are to upholding the settlement, whether you value peace at $10 billion or $5 billion. But suppose that if there is this 50-50 chance that you'll be unresolved and I'll get my way and a 50% 50 chance, 50 chance that you will be uh, resolved and you'll fight a war against me. So that's going to be bad for me. Let's just suppose that in this 50-50 scenario, I am going to want to try to overturn the status quo. It's better for me in expectation to take this sort of gamble and want to fight a war and try to hope that you're not going to intervene. All right? Well, let's say that you're the committed type. You would actually want to try to convince me to not even bother trying to overturn the status quo 
because doing so, if I were to do that, you would have to pay $7 billion to uphold the settlement. And while that's something that you would do, that's something that you would be willing to do, it's better for you to convince me that you're going to try to uphold the settlement, you're not going to run, because then you'll save that $7 billion in intervention cost, and you'll get to keep all $10 billion that comes from the peaceful settlement. Why won't it work if you say, I am the committed type to me? Why will that not convince me to not challenge you? Well, in this sort of situation where there's incomplete information, we have incentives to misrepresent. If you tell me that I am the committed type, or rather that you are the committed type, then if I were to believe you, that uncommitted type, that unresolved type that doesn't care too much about peace, that only values peace at $5 billion, would say the exact same thing to me. And if he's saying the exact same thing to me, well, I can't actually differentiate what's going on here. You can't just tell me that you're the committed type and I'm going to believe you because there's this incentive for the other type, the uncommitted type, to lie to me and to tell me that he is the committed type, even though he would run at the site of first blood. So talk is cheap here, right? That's a famous expression. That's why talk is cheap. It's because anyone can do that. Anyone can say I'm the committed type. What I really need to know is whether you actually are the committed type, and I want to see something that only the committed type would do, something that the uncommitted type would do, and it's the observation of that thing that the committed type would do and only the committed type would do that's going to convince me that you are, in fact, the committed type. So that's how costly signaling is going to come into play. Imagine that you have a stack of $10 billion in front of you. Is there something that you can do with all of that money to credibly reveal information that you are this resolved, committed type who is going to intervene if I try to overturn the status quo? And in fact, the answer is yes. There is something that you can do with that $10 billion. You can take $5 billion plus one and light it on fire. That's crazy, right? This sounds really weird. This is called burning money. But you can burn that amount of money, $5 billion plus one, and that's going to credibly reveal to me that you are, in fact, the committed type. Why is that the case? Well, think about the uncommitted type. The uncommitted type's best case scenario is that I believe that the, committed, that the uncommitted type is the committed type. And because I believe that the uncommitted type is the uncommitted type, I don't try to challenge the piece. So in this best case scenario, the uncommitted type is going to receive $5 billion because there's no war, right? So it's going to be able to keep that $5 billion it receives if there's peace in my country. Well, after you take out that $5 billion plus $1 that the unresolved type had to burn to do the same thing as the committed type, right? And it's trying to mimic what the committed type is doing. The committed type is burning $5 billion plus $1. Well, if the uncommitted type also burns $5 million plus $1... After you add in the five million, or sorry, the five billion dollars that the uncommitted type is going to receive by having peace be maintained in my country, it's still true that the uncommitted type is receiving a negative net value. It's receiving negative one dollar overall. But the uncommitted type could do absolutely nothing. It could even say, yes, yes, I am the uncommitted type. I am not going to intervene in your country. You can do whatever you want. And at worst, the uncommitted type would receive zero dollars instead. So there are no circumstances under which the uncommitted type, this unresolved type that doesn't care too much about the peace in my country, under no circumstances is he going to burn $5 billion plus $1. So if I observe $5 billion plus $1... I know that you cannot possibly be uncommitted to the situation. You have to be this committed type. So the last thing to verify is that the committed type would actually want to burn that amount of money. And it is true. The reason that this un that rather that the committed type would want to burn the money is because when the committed type burns the money, I update my belief that you are the committed type and I do not challenge, right? So if you are burning the money, then I know for sure that you are this committed type, and because I know for sure that you're the committed type, I'm not going to decide to try to overturn the status quo because it's not worth it to me to do that. Well, under this situation, under this case, if you are the committed type, you're resolved to the situation, you value peace at $10 billion, you're going to get peace because you're going to convince me that you're the committed type, and so you take the $10 billion you receive from peace, you subtract out $5 billion plus one, and you end up with $4,999,999,999. $999. 
your alternative there is to not burn any money or to burn less money, to burn an amount that the unresolved type or uncommitted type would be willing to burn. But if you were to burn that less amount of money, I'm going to infer that you are the uncommitted type and I'm going to challenge. That's going to cause you to intervene. And if you intervene, now you're only receiving $3 billion. So if you don't actually stick to this costly signaling action, this burning money, I'm going to believe that you're the unresolved type, the uncommitted type. And that's going to be costlier for you in the long run because you're going to have to pay that $7 billion to actually intervene. And so if you compare these two values, $3 billion for intervention versus $4 billion, or rather $5 billion minus $1 to make the costly signal and convince me that you're the committed type, well, it's better for you to make that costly signal. It's better for you to convince me that you actually are the committed type by burning that money. It's better than going through the situation and actually having to intervene and only end up with $3 billion. So that's costly signaling. There are two critical components here. There are two reasons why costly signaling works. First, the types cared about the issue at differential values. So you could have been this uncommitted or unresolved type, or you could have been this resolved and committed type. And depending upon which type you were, you valued peace at a differential amount. That's critical. The second component is that the committed type sacrificed more money than the less committed type would be willing to sacrifice. That credibly signals that you are the committed type. Talk is cheap, but burning money is not. And by virtue of the fact that you burn so much money, I recognize that you're the committed type and your deterrence succeeds. So that's costly signaling for you. That's how it works in a theoretical environment. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how this worked in Iraq when President Bush implements the Iraq surge. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.